Hello folks and welcome back to the channel. We're going to do something a little bit different today and we're going to go through every single one of the uh, cassette decks I've got that you guys haven't seen yet that are yet to come as far as their own repair videos. I decided to do this partly because I'm tired of working on the Sony stuff. We're not done with the summer of Sony yet but uh, mostly it's because I have been sick for the last oh three or four weeks now. Very likely it's COVID. It's been going around in the family, so I'm sure I've got it. It's not as bad as the last time I had it when I couldn't taste anything, but it's still plenty bad. Anyhow, you'll be seeing this the same week I shoot it. And the next two videos you see will be the ones I've already got done, and then hopefully by that third week or whatever, I'll be feeling better and I'll be ready to get into the triple six ES tape deck that uh, we really need to get into, because uh, yeah, unfortunately my other summer of Sony plans have not been working out. For now we're just going to go through every deck I have that you guys haven't seen yet, including the $800 Dragon Killer Beast that's sitting on the shelf to my right here. I've been very careful to leave that one off camera, so it can be a surprise, and well, today we're ruining the surprise. Because quite frankly, I can't wait to show it to you, so... Let's get into this now. Our first deck is this Optonica RT6405. Two heads, direct drive. This is the only direct drive two header in my collection so far. Paid 20 bucks for this thing. And what was the complaint? Well, two complaints. He said there was something going on with the transport, which, duh, 40 year old tape deck, of course there's something going on with the transport. And then he said the circuit board inside was broken where the uh, record level controls are. And uh, yeah, that's busted real good. But uh, other than that, I don't know if there's anything really major wrong with it. So we're going to find out right now. So let's plug it in. And I'm going to be doing all these tape decks in one segment after another, just in case I get too tired to continue, which is a possibility. I feel real sick today. But uh, yeah, we've got power to this thing. Let's see what happens. Okay, we've got uh, a VU indicator display and we saw segments lighting up. So at least it does turn on. I'm gonna set that to Chrome now because we're gonna try my test tape real quick here. The home theater is online. And yeah, let's open this up first. Nothing going on with the capstan, which concerns me. Usually direct drive models like this uh, will run the capstan motor all the time. Apparently this is not doing that, so uh, that could be by design or it could be a problem. So uh, let's get the test tape in there and see if it plays. Okay, playback works. We'll do the program search here and see if it if that works. Oh, and there's a buzzing in the audio. Program search does work. There is a buzz in the, in the audio, in the left channel. I don't know if you heard it or not. It sounds decent. I was hoping it would sound better than it does. I was hoping for something that would uh, finally take the Nakamichi BX150 down a peg, but this may not be the model. Yeah, it sounds very cold and sterile to me, so uh, maybe a host of new capacitors will fix that, but uh, let's get the lid off real quick and we'll see what's going on with the record controls. Well, folks, can you see it? Because I can see it. It's really quite obvious. Look down in there. Oh, and this is kind of wiggly loose too, but uh, 
Yeah, that's real broken back in there. We'll have to see if we can do something about that, but uh, I'll tell you that right, I'll tell you right now that uh, it's worse than just the circuit board being broken. See if I can even get you in there a look. You see that? The potentiometer in back itself is broken, so that whole pot assembly needs to be replaced. I don't know how I'm gonna fix that. I'm gonna try looking for an actual replacement that'll fit in here properly, but it could be that the only way to fix this will be to uh, drill holes in the back panel and install new pots back here or something. Those types of controls can be hard to find, so that'll be one issue to, to deal with because it won't record until that's fixed. But uh, yeah, we've got the usual slidey record switch there. That's going to have to be cleaned for sure. That could be the, the reason why it's buzzing the way it is, but might be other things going on there too. We've got a bunch of old capacitors here that likely need changing. Over on the transport side of things, there is a belt up here. Actually, I can see two belts. It's likely a mode belt and a real drive belt, it looks like. All powered off the real motor. So yeah, we're gonna have to find belts for this too even though it is a direct drive. Gigantic flywheel on this thing. And I can't stress to you enough how, how impressively well built this thing is. It's an entirely different beast from that to other Optonica I've got on the shelf, which is probably going away soon, but uh, yeah, that's this one. We're just doing a basic uh, Look, see at each deck. We're not going to get in depth with any of them today. So let me shut this off real quick and I'll go get the next one. Okay, deck number two. This one is an Iowa ADWX808. Not the dual cassette deck model I would have preferred from Iowa. The WX909 has a three head deck on the recording side, but uh, it is what it is. This deck is here because I wanted something with auto reverse that that would support DBX. And indeed, this is one such model. I couldn't find anything halfway decent that was direct drive and auto reverse that handled DBX. There's probably something out there, but uh, I haven't found it yet. But anyhow, there is some specialness going on with this uh, particular machine in that it's got a bias fine trim here. Not too many two-head decks have that, so when you find them, buy them. It's kind of a pain to adjust these on the on the two-head machines because you got to do trial and error with them, but uh, I like it when I have this functionality, even though I don't ever plan to record with this thing. But uh, yeah, we've got auto reverse on both sides, and I will tell you right now that this will not play on either side. It's an Iowa. The belts are going to be melted into into a puddle of goo by now. That's the way Iowa belts go. And that was the case with my uh, Carver TD1700 and my XK007. They both had belts that were just shot. So yeah, the complaint on this one was neither deck plays, obviously. And uh, the other problem with this one is, A, the feet are mi missing, and most of the uh, side panel screws are also missing. So. Uh, this one could be a fight, but uh, let's fire it up and see if it actually does anything at all. And yep, we've got a display. This switch is dirty. Not too bad. Let's see, we've got the synchro dubbing stuff there. Timer off and on, play, record, whatever. And yeah, we can try something, but it's it's not going to work. I, I can guarantee it. We'll try this uh, transport. Yeah, nothing happening. So, very obvious problems with this. And yeah, I just wanted something that was uh, 
auto reverse with DBX so I could play my new mixtapes I've been making on the uh, on the uh, big TAC machine in the office there. But uh, yeah, obviously this one's not doing anything special anytime soon. But thankfully, I have determined that the, the uh, belts this deck needs are the same ones that are required for the inner capstan belt on my TCK75. So when I do that order for uh, from Fix Your Audio, I'll just get another couple of belts and uh, this one will be settled. And I'd go off camera for this so you wouldn't have to watch me unscrewing things, but uh, there are only two screws remaining of the uh, the ones that hold this together, so easy to get into this one. Okay. Straight off, the belt is shot on this side. I knew it would be. How about this side? And yep, it's gone on this side too, so yep. Needs rebelting on both sides. Maybe we'll do a general transport service. It probably won't need very much. Maybe just belts, but uh, yeah, this is where I like Iowa. That's a audio grade capacity right there. 470 at 16 volts, it looks like. It's polarized, so it's definitely not one of the newer Nichicon Muse series, but it is a Nichicon. I can tell you that right now. It's the only brand I know of that makes those fancy bright green capacitors like that. Anyhow, not much else to see on this one, so let me close this up and we'll get to the next one. All right, our third deck of the day is this Nassian Distorted, or I mean, new acoustic dimension 6340. This is a two head model. And uh, I'll tell you right now, this is not my brand. It's never been my brand it's never gonna be my brand these things just look ugly as sin I'm sorry but uh, this brand is uh, somewhat known for being able to take on Nakamichi with some of the absolute worst build quality a guy has ever seen pretty much this one is here because it's got the distinction of having both Dyne Q and HX Pro in the same container Dine Q is a Tanberg thing. It's a headroom extension technology. And it's fascinating to me that it's coexisting in this deck with HX Pro, which was a uh, Bang & Olufsen invention. And uh, yeah, I'm just real curious about how this is gonna sound. I think it's got a real shot at absolutely beating the pants off the BX150, if I'm being honest. But uh, that's if we can get it working. Like I said, this one's made in China. There are others made in Taiwan, I think. I believe the Taiwanese ones are the uh, more preferred ones, but uh, whatever, I've got this one. So uh, let's plug it in and turn it on and see what it does. I don't remember what the problem is with this one. We've got one light there. Don't know what it means. turn it on. Oh, it already was on. And I heard some motor go in there. Let's see. Was it the capstan motor? I don't know. This one may work. It may not work. Let's find out. I've got the home theater on with this one, so uh, let me unmute it and we'll find out. Okay, off, chrome. Doesn't do a dang thing. And this is the other one I've got in the collection that's got a fine bias control, despite being only a two head. So yeah, this one's got a shot at beating the pants off the neck, because the neck can't do that. It doesn't have fine bias. So yeah, no rewind, no fast forward, no play. Okay, the cover is off, and uh, the capstan belt on this thing is good. 
So whatever's going on with it isn't... Well, maybe it's not good. I'm playing with a flywheel here and it's kind of stretchy. Just grab a dental pick here. Oh yeah, that's why it doesn't work. Belt is stretched, not broken. Let's plug it back in real quick. I want to see what happens. And I love my new stadium lights, as I call them. Never had so much light in here. There are no other room lights on, and it's lighting up the whole room, these uh, shop lights. Love it. Anyhow. Yeah, that's the problem. That belt can't move the transport anymore. Oh, and we've got a problem with the eject mechanism. Eject is not opening up. Okay, so it's stuck between modes now. Let's see, counterclockwise motor. So I'm going the wrong way. Okay, now we can open. So we'll try the test tape again and we'll see what happens. Yeah, it's working, it's just it can't drive the flywheel. And I don't know what's going on with the uh, rewind and fast forward. The real motor might be shot on this thing too, but uh, it's an NAD. For all we know, there could be 9,000 bad soldering joints in here. And uh, it wouldn't be the first time I've uh, seen somebody complain about that with one of these models. Okay, I'm going to put the cover back on and we'll go to the next one. All right, deck number four, but before we talk about it, I had a belt fall out of one of those decks I just showed you. I don't know which one. Gonna be fun figuring that out. Anyway, deck number four is a Victor, AKA JVC, Double D 99. This is a top of the line flagship model. And more than that, the quartz lock direct drive motor in here is, uh, or transport in here is known to be the lowest wow and flutter example of any consumer deck ever i think could be wrong i'm not sure anyway the spec on this thing is 0.019 percent it's below a dragon so uh yeah i have high hopes for this thing and uh i'm just gonna tell you right now i've already fallen in love with this thing so i'm very strongly considering getting another one of these but uh, anyhow, we gotta see what works and what don't work. So we'll jack it into the step-down transformer because it is a Japanese import. I paid 105 bucks for this. And then shipping cost me another 75, so this was way in budget. I can't believe I have it. And the reason it's it was so cheap is because it's got damage to the case on both sides and back, but uh, yeah. According to the seller, it turns on but doesn't do anything, just buzzes. So uh, we're going to have to find out exactly what happens when we try this thing. I'm excited. Okay, power is on. We've got a nice bright fluorescent display there. Counter is lit up. And this stuff is lit up. But I will tell you right now, there's a distinct chance that if the... Uh, auto calibration system in this thing doesn't work, I will not be able to do anything for it because it requires a special test jig to uh, to fix that. And uh, I'm just noticing some condition issues with the front panel here. It's flush here, but there's a lip over here. So there is some kind of a bendy thing going on here. And the door doesn't quite sit right either. So uh, yeah, that's the other reason I got it so cheap. And also, this is supposed to be quartz lock direct drive, like I said, but the uh, quartz lock light is not lit up, so uh, is the capstan motor running? No, it is not. But who knows, maybe it's like the, uh, the Autonico we just looked at. I'm going to unmute it. 
and we're gonna do a a test to see if it even goes into play. It may not. I'm not expecting anything. We'll go over to chrome tape, of course. Home theater should be unmuted. Oh, look at that. We've got quartz lock. So the capstan motor is running now. Good. So it keeps the uh, capstan motor disabled when it's when there's no tape in it. So question is, does it play? This thing's not supposed to play. It's playing. It's trying to play anyway. We've got no audio output. Well, there it goes. We've got one channel. There's hope for this thing. This thing wasn't supposed to work at all. It's working better than I expected. Okay, there's our audio output problem right there, is the tape source button. Yeah, we got one channel back that way. This thing's gonna have killer sound quality when I get done with it, I, I would hope. Yeah, we've got both channels in here now, but uh, there's no audio output at all on the right channel. That's probably going to be bad solder joints or bad capacitors. These things are infamous for bad capacitors, including and up to the uh, orange capacitors that always fail on the Nakamichi models. We're going to have to be very careful about that on this one. But uh, yeah, I was expecting to have to fully recap this anyway, so... Uh, yeah. So yeah, we've got a true flagship model here. One that I never expected to get as cheap as I got this one. I'll probably never find another one as cheap as this one. But yeah, I can't wait to get started on this one. It's extremely filthy, but uh, you've seen me clean up stuff like this before and uh, have them come out looking half decent. There are some scratches that won't go away, but uh, I can make it look better than this. All right, so the cover's off, and yeah, there's a lot going on in here. There's going to be a bunch of bad circuit glue, I can just tell. Underneath these capacitors, you can already see some. And uh, the power supply cap capacitors, cathode capacitors, yeah, that's what they are. These are garbage. I don't want to keep these. So I'm going to be probably doing a specialized order for this, because I doubt I have all the capacitors I need for it. But... Uh, Every single one of these is going to go up to Panasonic FR. I'll tell you that right now, and I'll probably be going up in value on at least, well, at least these two, plus this one. Who knows? Okay, so immediately I can tell that this has been serviced before. We've got numbers on all of these connectors to help figure out where they all go. Let's see here. Oh, that's loose. So we might have some broken, over-molded plastic here to deal with. I wouldn't be surprised anyway. Can't really tell if there's any uh, of the bad orange capacitors in here or not. Usually when these fail, it's because the, uh, the uh, orange capacitors on the motorboard go bad. And when that happens, they won't go into quartz lock at best, and they won't fire up at worst. But there's no way to look at that board the way this sits now, because it's literally buried in there. It's down in there. Right down inside there. So, uh, yeah, we'll have to do a full transport service for sure. I could hear that the idler tire was slipping on this, so that needs to be replaced. 
I'll probably go in with a new pinch roller. I believe this is a slightly non-standard pinch roller. It's the usual 13 millimeters by eight millimeters, but it's a 2.5 millimeter shaft. So uh, I do have one. I bought a couple of cheap Chinese ones for the uh, Bose AW1, but I'm not gonna use those cheap Chinese ones in this thing. I'm gonna try and find a better one for this. Most likely I'll get one from Fix Your Audio. Those are good enough. But uh, yeah, look at all this stuff that's going on in here. Ooh, they thought about serviceability. This is cool. Let me just undo a couple screws here and I'll show you how this works. I apologize if this one's taking too long, but it is a flagship, so uh, we can take a couple extra minutes on this one. Might be a longer video, but that's okay. I'm going to have to take the next couple of weeks off anyway, just to rest and recover. Check this out. Magic. Okay, let's see if we can find any bad orange capacitors in here. Let's see, I think this is the AutoCal board here. I don't see any known problematic caps there. Every electrolytic has to go. And probably do some of those measurements on camera right now actually but uh, we've still got quite a few other decks to go through so uh, yeah there's lots to do with this one I desperately would love to get into this thing right now and just fix it all up and have it work perfectly but uh, unfortunately I don't have time to get to it right now and I just don't feel up to it either so let me get this put back together and we'll move on to the next one all right, our next deck is a genuine monster of a unit. Look at the size of this thing. It's like 16 inches deep or something like that. Anyhow, this is an Akai GXR88. This, depending on the way you run the numbers, is either the cheapest or the second cheapest three-head machine I have. It's kind of fighting it out between this and, uh, and uh, the... Sony TCK75. That one was cheaper in general to buy before shipping, but with shipping, this one's cheaper. I paid 120 bucks for this. I didn't originally pay 120 bucks for this, but I ended up paying that because uh, the way the seller shipped it was, it was shipped standing up on this side, like that, in an old computer tower case, or computer tower box i should say and what happened was during shipping it was kind of bouncing around and the entire door broke off and i was able to fix that and i would show you how i fixed that but i can't reason being if i so much as take this off one too many times it's going to break permanently and then i'll never get it back on again so uh the only time i take this off will be when i get to the servicing part of this of this uh, particular machine whichever that happens to be there might be more wrong with it the original complaint with this was it makes noise and there's no display. So uh, let's fire it up and see. I can tell you right now it will not play at all. I know what that noise is. So uh, yeah, let's fire it up. You can hear that, right? What you are hearing is the sound of a mode belt that is no longer there. The mode motor is trying to cycle the mechanism and can't. This is the same issue that happens with the, uh, the GXZ9100 if you neglect it long enough. So, uh, yeah, either the... I can't think anymore. I might have to take a break soon. Anyway, the belt is very clearly broken, otherwise it wouldn't be buzzing like that and uh, very likely the pinch rollers are gummed up and immobile so this will require a hell of a lot of service and yeah they were right no display but uh, yeah the reason I bought this one is not only is it three head it's quick reverse auto reverse and it's kind of special it's got a double direct drive transport yes the way it, re it does the auto reverse thing is it is it runs the uh, 
a direct drive motor independently for each uh, direction. And then it uses the other direct drive motor to supply inner capstan tension. So uh, I'm going to shut that off. It's annoying. So yeah, I wanted this one just as a general auto reverse machine to have around for... Uh, that's broken right there. See that crack? Oh well. It looks pretty good for something that was busted in shipping, but... Uh, yeah, I just wanted something that was halfway decent auto reverse that could maybe replace the uh, Sansui D905R because I think I should probably be selling that unit, but uh, I don't know if this is going to be the model to do that or not. This one is an auto calibrating three head machine. Not exactly sure how you get to that functionality on this. Oh, right there. Or no, that's auto mute. It's here somewhere. Anyway. Let's get the cover off and we'll see if we can figure out what's going on with at least the display. I'm betting it's bad solder joints. Well, folks, what did I tell you? That belt is goo right there. And it's not the only one. I can see every belt in there is goo. This one's completely missing. This is the mode belt right here. See, it's trying to change modes and it can't. It doesn't feel like anything's jammed up in there, so maybe this one won't be as bad as the GXE 9100 was. Help if I knew which way this motor was running. Anyway, screw it. We don't have time for this. Obviously the direct drive motor is functioning, at least in the one direction. I don't know if they both are, but uh, you can clearly see them running down in there, but I want to see what's going on with this uh, display. Okay, so if I'm right, this is a bad solder joint and nothing more. Let me push down using something insulated. Let me find something insulated. On the uh, top circuit board, and we'll see if the display comes on. Ha! Ah, there it is, right there. It's a bad solder joint. Or a bad connection. That's all it is. So, yeah. There could be more to it than that. And there probably is. This is a very complicated machine. As you can clearly see. But, uh, oh. Got a relay back here, too. That might have to be replaced. Quiet, you. And oh joy of joys, that's a 24 volt relay. So I cannot use the same type of relay I used on the uh, BX150. That has to be separately ordered. Great. I wonder what that relay even does. It's in the general vicinity of these head wires, so it's probably something to do with the record and play switch switching. Well, no, wait, can't be. It's a three-head machine. Oh well, we'll deal with that later. But yeah, I'm confident I can get this one going. It's probably going to take a lot to, to get it going, but uh, let me close up shop and we'll get to the next one. All right, our next tape deck. And I feel so bad about this one. This is a TAC V770, basically second one down from top of the line when it was introduced. The uh, V970X is the one above this. It's the direct successor to my V900X. And I'm still looking for a V970X, but I'm really not that interested in going out of my way for one. I had somebody offer to uh, send me one of those to fix up for the channel and uh, hopefully get it working again, but at that time I wasn't confident enough in my abilities to uh, take such a thing on because uh, there are still aspects of the V900X that I can't fix yet, namely the auto calibration system in that thing. If that ever failed, I don't know what I would do. I would have to figure out how it works and how to fix it and how to align it. And it's just not something I want to get into anytime soon. So, uh, yeah, I might have to do that anyway on the Denon DRM3 because it's still got an issue with the recording amplifier. We might get into that at some point in the future, but uh, I don't know. 
What I'm trying to do on that machine is recap the whole audio chain on it. I've done the playback chain on the DRM3 now, and it sounds better than it did. I've got Panasonic FRs in the power supply of that machine, and also uh, I used my Nichicon UKZ Muse capacitors for the first time in that deck. And I don't know what's contributing to the better sound, but it's probably not the Muse caps, it's probably the Panasonic FRs in the power supply, but uh, we're not talking about that, we're talking about this, which has now been here for so long that it probably thinks I forgot about it, but... Uh, Nope, haven't forgotten about it. I've just struggled to want to do anything with it. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to have to try to get into this soon. Maybe September, if I can. I don't know. Depends when I'm over this whatever I have now, which, is again, is probably COVID. But, uh, yeah, I can't even remember what the initial complaint was with this thing. For all I know, it works. So let's plug it in and find out, shall we? I've got the audio unmuted to the home theater, so if it does play, we'll know it. Okay, took a little bit to come up, but it did come up. We do have a display there. This has power loading, I think. I could be wrong, and I can't even see the uh, labels on these, on these uh, buttons here. It's so bright in here. Don't know what half this stuff does. We've got an intro check, CPS, CDS, start memo, stop memo, whatever the heck that is. Here's our tape source. That does appear to work. And we've got an auto monitor. I don't know what that is. Okay, there's the Dolby buttons. MPX filter. That appears to work. Usual transport controls. We got fine tuning for bias here. And this level control is not for level adjustment of a recording gain, that's for headphones only. So uh, it does not have that functionality, it looks like. I don't know what this start and stop memo stuff is. Maybe it's for program selection. I don't know what's going on with that. Let's see if the door, the door the, 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 the door opens. Okay, it does open. I seem to recall that about this deck as being uh, actually working. So does it work? Let's find out. Okay, we've got Chrome selected in here, so that works. And the one thing about this generation of TIAC machines is they have HX Pro. The V900X doesn't have that. Doesn't seem to matter with that deck, but uh, it doesn't have it, so let's see if we can get it to play. Well, actually, rewind, that works. Fast forward works. Okay, let's go for play. Yeah, it works. It is a little bit loud, but uh, it's got the usual TIAC loading belt thing going on in there, so uh, even the idler seems to be good in this thing. That doesn't mean it is good. I might still have to replace it, but it's clearly moving the reels along. And that's a good thing because it does not use the same idlers that uh, the V900X does. Yeah, this thing works. Probably just needs a general service. So the next time I'm feeling in the mood to uh, not do too much work, this might be a good candidate to go to. And now I'll probably be selling this one or something after I immediately get done with it, because uh, I just don't know that I need to have this in my permanent collection. But uh, yeah. Well, folks, I shouldn't have opened this thing up. Now I want to keep it. This thing is fantastic the way it's laid out. Look at this. There's lots of room for activities in here. 
probably because this housing is designed for the V970X and all its extra circuitry or whatnot, but I really like the way this is laid out. TX great like that sometimes. You've got your usual belt drive capstan motor going here, and look at this. You can change this mode belt without even having to take the transport out. You can just do it right from here. How fantastic is that? Now I will be doing a general service on this anyway, which means taking the transport out anyway, and uh, I'll give it a new belt at that time. I don't know if this one's bad at all. Oh, I can see the idler from here. Let me get a dental pick in there. Actually, that does kind of look like the same idler as the V900X has. Maybe I'll replace it if it is. I don't know. It doesn't strike me as needing replacement, though, so uh, I don't know. I just love the way this thing's built. Look at this. Gold-plated connectors back here. Extremely well laid out. And the one thing I really didn't like about this was... Uh, the fact that it uses IC switching to go between tape and source, which inevitably means more noise in the signal, but uh, you could swap this with a relay like I did in the RSB755 and it would be fine like that. Maybe there's other modifications I could do to this to improve it over and above the way it is now. I've got op amps, I've got bipolar capacitors, I've got everything I need to do it maybe. So yeah, that might be something worth looking into on this one. But yeah, this thing really does not need much at all. Just a general service and that's it. Oh, and the capstan belt's even good, so... No need for even new belts at all. Both belts are good. Alright, here's our next item up for bids. Well, not for bids, but for consideration. This one's kind of a special unit. I'm saving this one for my birthday because it is the same age as I am. It dates from 1973. That's how old this thing is. Don't know if anything at all works on this. Probably not, but uh, we're gonna find out real quick. So let me plug it in. Actually, let me unmute the receiver first. Actually, maybe I shouldn't unmute the receiver, considering the age of this one, but uh, whatever, we'll take a chance. All right, power on. I hear something spinning up in there. Eject works. I don't know if play works at all, so I'm not going to use the uh, test tape I have been using. I'm going to use my... Uh, original one that got eaten by the uh, JVC Auto Reverse. So, does this thing play at all? Well, before we try that... The Dolby Light works. Cool! Okay, now we'll try the playback. Had to stop it immediately because it was moving, but uh, no take-up drive. Meter is deflecting, so it will play. But I think it's only playing on one channel. Let's find out. Oh yeah, she's got lots of problems. That is going to be the record switch. So let me eject this real quick. We're going to try to clean that the, uh, the cheap and old-fashioned way together here. I've got a tape over here that I use for test recordings. We're going to try using this one to uh, clean this switch. And this is how I'm doing that. Okay, let's see if that made a difference. And this one's already been eaten. That's fine. It's it's just a test tape. It doesn't need to be 
in perfect condition. All right, let's try this again. Do we get music now? Yes. But only on one channel. So this thing needs serious help. Many, 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 many seriousnesses of it. This needs big time help. Is what I mean to say with my COVID addled brain here. So, this will be my uh, birthday project. November we'll get to this one, I hope. But uh, given the way this thing's acting, I think it's possibly going to take more than one video. So, we'll see what happens. Anyhow, we've got one deck left. And then we're getting to the $800 gorilla in the room. Finally, I cannot wait to show you that machine. All right, last one before getting to the $800 Dragon Killer. Or I say Dragon Killer, I don't know for sure. I don't have a dragon to compare against, so how would I know? Anyway, what we have here is a Pioneer CTF 615, and God, what a gorgeous looking deck. For my money, they don't get any better looking than this. I love this one just as much as I love my CTF 900. And I've been looking for more of these uh, Blue Line Fluoroscan units ever since I did the uh, CTF 900, which as I recall, I had to talk myself into because I didn't think I could even afford it, but it turned out to be the best thing for my channel yet, aside from the decks that are, you know, Nakamichi, but uh, yeah, I am just in love with this thing already. I will never part with any of these blue Fluoroscan units that I get. I'm keeping them all as long as I'm alive. This is the only brand I will collect as much as I will collect the Sony stuff in silver. Anyhow, I don't remember what the complaint was with this thing. It probably does not play at all. But who knows, we're gonna find that out now. I just love all these switches and... Oh, it's just so beautiful to me. Anyway, let's turn her on and see what happens. Let's plug her in first, then turn it on. I've got audio hooked up, but uh, I don't think this is gonna play, so... Uh... Oh, there it is. There's that beautiful blue Fluoroscan action right there. Headlock comes up and down. You can see it doing it in there. Obviously there's no take up action going on. It's acting like it's trying to do rewind and fast forward, but obviously can't. So yeah, this is not going to play at all. We'll throw a tape in there anyway, just to uh, see if it does anything. Oh, it does try to move the reels a little bit. Maybe the brakes are on or something and it just can't do anything. Anywho, obviously this is not going to play for us. You have no idea how many times I've talked myself out of fast tracking this one into the uh, service schedule. So uh, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to resist getting into this one. Supports all four tape types, including metal. So that's one thing it can do that the 900 can't. So, uh... I'm hoping to use this often once I get it working. It just looks so good. All right, inside the Pioneer, and it's actually really clean in here. It's in better shape in here than uh, the 900 was, I think. Could be wrong. But anyway, here's our uh, recording switch. It's one of the slidey doohickeys again. Only in this one, it's activated by a, an actual solenoid here. So uh, there's no actual arm that goes back to the transport on this. It's all activated by uh, circuitry. 
So uh, yeah, this one's gonna be getting a power supply recap for sure. Possibly more than that. We'll see what I feel like doing once I get into there, but uh, I'll tell you right now exactly what's wrong with the transport. Actually, why don't I even show you? You see that? Way back in there, the uh, flywheel there? There is no belt on there. It's gone. And uh, there's a real drive belt, and that is gone. It's hard to show you that one, but it's under this plate somewhere. It's, yeah, it's missing. No, not there. No bueno. So yeah, that's the problem with this one. It just needs rebuilting and uh, probably other general maintenance. And this one should be going again. So not too much of a problem. So if I want to get into this real soon, I can. I was hoping to save this until after I was done that uh, Pioneer receiver, but uh, I don't know. The Pioneer receiver I'm kind of struggling to get into because uh, I've got that mental block that says I can't fix amplifiers. But uh, I'll tell you right now, there is an amplifier on the shelf right now that I'm midway through servicing. It's an Onkyo surround sound receiver. It's got a blown out channel on it. And if I can fix that, maybe I'll get the confidence I need to uh, tackle the big Pioneer receiver. Because the Pioneer receiver really doesn't have much wrong with it. So, uh, yeah, if I can talk myself into it, I'll do the, the receiver first. If I can't, this will come first, probably. Either way, there's going to be Pioneer back on the channel soon. And I'll tell you right now, I'm real pissed off about the Japanese auctions right now because I found a Pioneer CTA-9. According to a lot of people, that's the best tape deck Pioneer has ever made. And this one was in extremely rough condition. It had both sides rusted out real bad. The front panel was filthy. The, uh, the record level knob was mangled on it. And I thought, terrific! I'll bid on that one and I'll see if I can get it. And uh, the one time I checked, it was, I think, 35 bucks or so it had on it. And I thought that uh, surely that one couldn't possibly go for a lot of money, but... Uh, no, I went back to it when I was getting ready for bed. It had eight hours left on the auction, and it was already over 200 bucks. And I checked again this morning, and it sold for 613 bucks. That one did. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if I'll ever get that model anytime soon. And uh, for that kind of money, maybe I want the CTA9D instead. Or CTA9X. I don't know. But uh, we'll have to see. This Pioneer stuff, it seems to have a, a real cachet over there. Just as mu much as Nakamichi. So uh, who knows when the next Pioneer's coming to the channel. But uh, for now, we'll get to this one. This one should be fun. And uh, yeah, that's it. We are all out of tape decks. And I am all out of excuses. It's time to get to the beast. Give me a few minutes here to set the stage and we'll get to it. All right, folks, it is finally time. I have been wanting to show you this thing for years. Well, not years. Ah, uh, COVID, guys. Try not to get it. Messes with your brain. I've been waiting to show you this for months now. Initially, when I started this year off, I wanted to do two flagships from Japan, top of the line, in every single possible way, and the first of those was the A&D GXZ9100, which turned into a beast of a deck. It's still my number one unit, but uh, the other one has the potential of completely unseating it. And it's right under this cloth right here. And uh, yeah, I'm just trying to, to tease this out just a little bit because uh, this is a very special tape deck. According to a lot of people, this is the best tape deck this company has ever made, period. There's one other that some say is in dispute for that title, but uh, we'll get into that when the unveiling's over here. But uh, this is direct drive, quartz lock, dual capstan, all that good stuff. And uh, yeah, you're going to find out what makes it so special real quick. At least I hope you will. And at least I hope I will, because this was expensive as hell. Cost me 560 bucks to win the auction and 160 bucks to ship it the slow way because it is extremely heavy. 
The manufacturer thought, for whatever reason, that it was a good idea to bolt a big piece of wood to the bottom of this thing. And I know some of you have already figured out what this is based on that comment alone. But uh, just to give you a couple more hints, we've already seen this brand in this video. And we've already serviced this brand on the channel. In fact, we've serviced this transport before on the channel. So, uh, all right, folks, here goes nothing. You're about to find out what's under the blanket. This is a Victor, a.k.a. G JVC, I can't talk anymore, TDV 931. Like I said, best it ever got from them. And, uh, I cannot wait. I gotta find out if this thing works because it was sold to me in working condition. But it's gonna still need some attention. There's a, uh, a pair of plastic gears in the transport that always break on these. I've got replacements already from Fix Your Audio. And uh, yeah, the other thing is the direct drive motors on these things tend to run away and that's because the capacitors fail. So uh, that's the other bit of maintenance this will need right away when we get to it. I don't know when I'll get to it because, uh, yeah, I've got so many other things I have to finish up first, but uh, I'm hoping September or October we'll get into this and uh, do the service it needs. But uh, yeah, you can see this thing is massive, absolutely massive. It's like six inches tall sitting on the uh, table here. It's like enormous, but uh, yeah. When I say it costs 160 to ship this the slow way, I wasn't kidding. The couriers all wanted 300 bucks to ship this one because it is just heavy. This is a, a good three quarter inch thick wooden plate on the bottom here, so that's not helping the weight at all. But anyhow, we've got power applied. We've got audio set up, so let's see if this actually does work as well as they say it did. Okay, the display's on, counter is on. Does the door open? Yes, it does. Are the capstans running? They are running, but it looks like they might be running away. Oh, well, maybe not. I think it's okay. I'm gonna have to figure out what what pinch rollers to get for this thing because it's uh, not using any kind of standard size it looks like. It looks like they're both 10 millimeter. Well, you guys have waited this long enough to see this thing. Let's do a little bit of general maintenance while we've got the uh, the access to it here. I want to clean the heads and I want to clean the cap stands real quick. before we try and play this, because uh, I need to hear this thing. And I don't want to hear this thing with dirty heads. Okay, let's go in and we'll clean the uh, cap stands, which are filthy, but actually not that bad. Yeah, a little bit of dirt on there, but uh, nothing serious. And if this plays too fast, I'll make excuses for the deck right now. It's because of those capacitors in the direct drive motor. They are known to go bad. And they're surface mount, so uh, yeah, that's why we can't wait too long to get to the service of this deck. At least that's what I'm going to tell myself here. And there's almost nothing on the heads. That's good. Maybe we got a low hours machine here. There's a little bit of dirt in here, but not too bad. Just cleaning the rest of the tape path real quick because I don't want my tape to get eaten. And when I say that we've already seen this uh, transport before, I'm not kidding. Remember that auto reverse deck? Yeah, that's the same transport. Basically, that's why this thing is here. I wanted to give JBC one more chance because uh, I was so unimpressed with that transport and that deck that I thought, let's go right to the top. Let's see what this brand has got going for it here. 
So yeah, here lies a TDV 931. Okay, that's fixed and ready to go. We'll give it a minute or so here to uh, dry out the heads and stuff before we try to play something on it. Let's take a look at the features first. We'll leave it powered up for a little bit. Okay, we've got our usual line input here with a balance control. But we've also got a direct and a CD fine direct for low impedance. Cool, I don't know exactly what I would need that for. We've got the defeatable HX Pro that the uh, that the A and D machine has, so it's at least competitive in that for in that uh, area. B and C Dolby switching seems to work. We've got recording calibration, of course. No calibration bias tones like the A and D machine has, unfortunately, but uh, that's fine. We've got a headphone control with uh, adjustable volume. We've got a display defeat. I think the A and D does that too. A call button, I don't know what that does. Oh, it's flashing the, the decibel thing there. So I don't know what that is. Anyhow, we've got your usual fast forward and rewind, music scan. The A and D does that too. It's just uh, not something we really explored in those videos. Source and tape switching is done with the relay. I hear it clicking away in there. Oh, I can't wait to find out how well this thing records, but uh, we gotta wait for that. Right now, we're gonna see if it plays. Okay, chrome tape is recognized. Let's see what happens. It's playing too fast, and we know why it's playing too fast. Those caps are dead. Rewind works. Fast forward works. So yeah, technically it does work, as it was sold to me, but uh, also, technically, it needs a lot of help in the, in repairs here. So, you want to see the inside? I want to see the inside. I've waited months for this. I have to see the inside. All right, before we get into this thing, I just wanted to show you the back panel real quick. Look at all this. Gold plating everywhere. And then we've got the CompuLink synchro stuff that JVC loves to do, so... Maybe it'll interface well with the uh, absolute dumpster fire you guys haven't seen yet. That's coming to the channel in one of the videos I've previously completed, thankfully. But uh, yeah, maybe it will work with that. Maybe it wouldn't. I don't know. I don't care about that machine. But you'll see it soon enough. Right now we gotta take the cover off and behold the majesty within. And there it is, look at this. Copper plating on all these uh, board holders here. And look at this. You've got the entire potentiometer assembly way back here, connected to the front panel with these uh, extension rods. That's some kind of attention to, for detail you don't see very often, I'll tell you what. Just the build quality of this thing is impressive, to say the least. And I'm seeing audio grade capacitors everywhere. Let's see, what do we got going on here? Are these Panasonic Purisms? No, wait, they're Nippon Chemicon. I thought they were Matsushita, but no. They're Chemicon. What are they? 35 volts, 6,800 microfarads. I might upgrade those, I might not. They're already pretty beastly. I don't think this really needs it any. 
how. But uh, I'll just zoom you in here if I can. You can see one of the capacitors in question right there. See that little silver can right there? That's one of the surface mount ones we got to get rid of. It'll be dead. And I know it'll be dead now because this thing was playing fast. So, uh, yeah, that is the same transport as the one we looked at in the uh, auto reverse unit. It's just set up for a dual capstan single direction in this one. And uh, I don't know how good this belt is. I don't know if I can even get my finger on it to, uh, to find out, but uh, I've actually got a special belt for this. Let me set you down real quick and I'll show you. All right, the belt I plan to install in this thing is this one, an FRSP 8.97. This is the best belt possible that you can get for uh, Nakamichi direct drive units like the uh, BX300 uses this belt. In fact, this was developed exactly for the, the Nakamichi direct drive units. So uh, I got the belt measurements from uh, from Marion at Fix Your Audio, and they are very close to this, so I'm betting this is going to work. And in fact, I'm betting this same belt is going to work for the uh, Sony 666ES as well. I, and I've got one of these for that machine. So, uh, yeah, what I like about this one is it's extremely thin. It's like 0 0.4 millimeters thick. So, uh, yeah, I've got three of these. I got one for the uh, GXZ9100 as well, but I don't know if I'll be installing it anytime soon because I hate trying to get the transport out of that machine. But, uh, yeah, I cannot wait to get into this model, especially now that I know it's running fast and, and that's the only problem with it so far. It's got two gears in here that love to break off, and I will be replacing those as general service, but... Uh, yeah, I don't even know if this thing needs or wants any uh, new pinch rollers even. But yeah, this is a very special tape deck and I'm glad I have it even if it cost me a ton of money just to get my hands on one. Just looking at these other caps here. These are Chemicon AWF series it looks like. Those will be audio grade I'm sure. But uh, yeah. This is one beast of a unit. I can't tell you how impressed I am with how this thing is constructed. It's just ridiculous. There is no North American equivalent to this thing. This is a Japanese market only deck. And uh, I mentioned before that there is one other model that may lay claim to uh, being the best ever JVC made, and that's the TDV-1. That's also a Japanese domestic market only unit. And uh, I believe that one's got a 210 kilohertz bias frequency too. So uh, I don't think this one has that. So maybe I'll try and find one at some point. But uh, for now, it's enough that I have this one. This thing is a monster. I can't tell you how big and impressive this thing is in person. But uh, yeah, maybe you can tell by the fact that uh, here's a standard cassette held up against it. This is how big this thing is. I can't stop looking at it. I should have the cover on this now, but I can't stop. It's so beautiful. Look at this. Copper foil on top of the ICs for shielding. When have ever, you ever seen that before? All right, one last little segment on the uh, Gigantor here before we conclude this video. Yes, I did get the remote to go with it. I was not even going to consider one that did not have the remote. And uh, one other thing I should mention is uh, I've been assured that uh, very rarely can you even find these for any less money than I paid for this one. So uh, if you're thinking of getting one from Japan, you just, just be ready to spend money because you're going to have to. Anyhow, I got an actual factory brochure for this one because I just had to. So we're going to take a look through this to see what other tape decks they had going on at this uh, particular time. This one's kind of not in great shape, but uh, it is what it is. Okay, CD players. We're not really that here for that, are we? 
trying to give you a good look at this brochure. Lots of nice stuff in here though, I gotta say. JVC is known as being the brand of junk very cheap in some in most cases, but not this time. This uh, tape deck we're looking at today is not junk and it's not very cheap. I'll tell you that right now. My wallet is still hurting from it. Anyhow, JVC's top of the line stuff is usually known for being the opposite of junk very cheap, if you will. Okay, here we go. These, these are the tape decks. Here's our TDV 931 right there. I'll just try and zoom you in here. And uh, in keeping with JVC's tradition of uh, extremely well-performing direct drive tape decks, I think this one clocks in at 0.021% wow and flutter. If it's in fully working order, we'll have to see if we get anywhere near that. The next one down is the TDV 731. We don't have a corresponding model for this either in uh, North America. This one's a belt drive dual capstan, I think. Could be wrong. And you can see what the suggested retail price of this one was. 69,800 yen. And uh, the one we've got in front of us is 87,000 yen. And if I do the mental conversion in my head, this amount today would be right about $860. So yeah, when I say $800 beast, I mean it. Back then, now, that's what it's going to cost you. Okay, the next one down listed in here is the TDB 631. Not too familiar with that model. Then we've got the TDR 631, auto reverse, not interested. I will never own another JVC auto reverse, at least based on this transport. I think I know why that auto reverse unit ate the tape that time. I think it's because it had poor back tension, but uh, the electronics in that deck failed and I decided I didn't want to fix it anymore. So uh, yeah, basically it stopped producing output yet again. So I couldn't recycle it. I didn't want to fix it. So it's a parts deck now. And uh, it's got two idlers I can use to, to fix this unit with. So uh, we should be set for idlers. So I don't think I need to get another idler. Anyhow, we got the TDR321 and the TDWR531. These are both auto reverse. But uh, a lot of people say the second best sounding JVC tape deck of all time is the TDV721, which is their version of our TDV1010. That's the one 12 volt vids has. And he calls that one a dragon killer, and this one's supposed to be even better than that one, so uh, who knows? I've got high hopes for this thing. That's all I'll say about that. But uh, continuing on, we've got speakers here. Not really that interested in JVC speakers. Processor and selector. Ooh, look at this cool remote here. Ain't that wild? I almost want to get one just from the way that looks. Theatone, Dolby Pro Logic surround system. Looks like that's a whole system they got going on there. But I don't see this tape deck in here. You'd think they'd put their flagship model in there, but no, apparently not. But yeah, I'm excited. I've got two JVC flagships sitting right next to me here. One of which is so heavy, it's threatening to break the table. Anyway, we've got CD mini components here. Uh, that doesn't look too mini to me, but uh, whatever. Maybe I just need to see them in person. Mezzo compact stereo. Creation. Whatever, I'm not here for these. I'm here for the tape decks. And apparently the boom boxes. JVC boom boxes of the 90s actually sound quite decent. I had, I've never owned one, but I have heard them. Some of them sound really decent, in fact. Their 80s boom boxes weren't all that known for being good sounding, but their 90s ones, I will vouch for them. Headphone stereo. This is obviously the days before mini discs. Otherwise, we'd be seeing mini disc players in here too. But uh, yeah, I guess that's going to be the end of the uh, catalog here. 
Cool little catalog. And yeah, I cannot wait to get started on this. Yeah, September. I'm going to get into this in September. I can't let it sit for too much longer than this because you know those capacitors are leaking in there. So, yeah, I guess that's going to be it for today, guys. I'll see you in the next video. I'm going to go rest now. Take care.